Hello and welcome to January 7th, the science of mind in a year. And this is a big reading today. We're going to get through a lot. So we are starting on page 29. We are in the chapter, The Thing Itself. We are starting at Limitless Power at a Person's Disposal. It actually says man's disposal. But as you've heard before, we're making the language more inclusive because this was the language language that was used back when Ernest Holmes was writing this in the 30s, I believe. I'll have to double check that. A long time ago. All right, 29. Limitless power at a person's disposal. Marvelous as the concept may be, it is nonetheless true that a person has at their disposal in what we call their subjective mind a power that seems to be limitless. This is because they are one with the whole on the subjective side of life. A person's thought, falling into their subjective mind, merges with the universal subjective mind and becomes the law of their life, through the one great law of all life. There are not two subjective minds. There is but one subjective mind. And what we call our subjective mind is really the use we are making of the one law, or the one subjective mind. Each individual maintains their identity in law, through their personal use of it, and each is drawing from life what we think into it. To learn how to think is to learn how to live. For our thoughts go into a medium that is infinite in its ability to do and to be. A person, by thinking, can bring into their experience whatsoever they desire. If they think correctly and become a living embodiment of their thoughts, this is not done by holding thoughts, but by knowing the truth. Within us, then, there is a creative field, which we call the subjective mind. Around us, there is a creative field, which we call subjective. One is the universal, and the other is individual, but in reality, they are one. There is one mental law in the universe, and where we use it, it becomes our law because we have individualized it. It is impossible to plumb the depths of the individual mind, because the individual mind is really not individual, but is individualized. Behind the individual is the universal, which has no limits. In this concept alone lies the possibility of eternal and endless expansion. Everyone is universal on the subjective side of life, an individual only at the point of conscious perception. The riddle is solved, and we all use the creative power of the universal mind every time we use our own mind. The next section is All Thought is Creative. Since this is true, it follows that we cannot say that one thought is creative while another is not. We must say that all thought is creative according to the nature, impulse, emotion, or conviction behind the thought. Thought creates a mold in the subjective in which the idea is accepted and poured and sets power in motion in accordance with the thought. Ignorance of this excuses no one from its effects, for we are dealing with law and not with whimsical fancy. The conscious mind is superior to the subjective and may consciously use it. Great as the subconscious is, its tendency is set in motion by the conscious thought, and in this possibility lies the path to freedom. The karmic law is not kismet. It is not fate, but cause and effect. It is a taskmaster task to the unwise, a servant to the wise. And the next section is the road to freedom is not mysterious. Experience has taught us that the subjective tendency of this intelligence, intelligent law of creative force may consciously be directed and def, definitely used. This is the greatest discovery of all time. There is no mystery here, but a profound fact and a demonstrable one. The road to freedom lies not through mysteries or occult performances, but through the intelligent use of nature's forces and laws. The law of mind is a natural law in the spiritual world. But what do we mean by the spiritual world? We mean the world of conscious intelligence. The subjective is a world of law and of mechanical order. In our lives, it is largely, largely a reaction, an effect, a way. It is never a person, though it often appears to act as though it were one. Right here, many are completely misled, mistaking subjective impulses for actual personalities. This, however, is a field of investigation not fully to be considered here. The simplest way to state the proposition is to say that we have a conscious mind that operates within a subjective field, which is creative. The conscious mind is spirit. The subjective mind is law. One is a, com a complement of the other, and no real individuality could be expressed without a combination of both. No person has ever plumbed the depths of either the conscious or the subjective life. In both directions, we reach out to infinity 
And since we cannot encompass infinity, we shall always be expanding and always enlarging our capacity to know and to experience. We need not ask why these things are so. There can be no reason given as to why the truth is true. We do not create laws and principles, but discover and make use of them. Let us accept this position relative to the laws of mind and spirit and see what we can do with them, rather than how we may contradict the inevitable. Our mind and spirit is our echo of the eternal thing itself, and the sooner we discover this fact, the sooner we shall be made free and happy. The universe is filled with spirit and filled with law. One reacts to the other. We are spirit and we are law. The law of our life reacts to our spiritual or material concepts and builds and rebuilds according to our beliefs and faith. The next section is learning to trust will make us happy. All people seek some relationship to the universal mind, the oversoul, or the eternal spirit, which we call God. And life reveals itself to whoever is receptive to it. That we are living in a spiritual universe, which includes the material or physical universe, has been a conclusion of the deepest thinkers of every age. That this spiritual universe must be one of pure intelligence and perfect life, dominated by love, by reason, and by the power to create, seems an inevitable conclusion. There is a power in the universe that honors our faith in it. There is a law in the universe which exacts the uttermost farthing. We all wish to feel that the power behind everything is good, as well as creative and eternal and changeless intelligence in which people live and move and have their being. Intuitively, we sense that every person in their native state is some part or manifestation of this eternal principle, and that the entire problem of limitation, evil, suffering, and uncertainty is not God-ordained, but is the result of ignorance. It has been written that the truth shall make us free, provided we know the truth, and we note that the evolution of humanity's consciousness brings with it the acquisition of new powers and higher possibilities. We find ourselves torn by confusion, by conflict, by affirm affirmation and denial, by emotion congested by fear and congealed by pride. We are afraid of the universe in which we live, suspicious of people around us, uncertain of the salvation of our own souls. All these things negatively react and cause physical disorders. Nature seems to await our comprehension of it, and since it is governed by immutable laws, the ignorance of which excuses no person from their effects, the bondage of humanity must be a result of our ignorance of the true nature of reality. The storehouse of nature may be filled with good, but this good is locked to the ignorant. The key to this door is held in the mind of intelligence, working in accordance with universal law. Through experience, people learn what is really good and satisfying, what is truly worthwhile. As their intelligence increases and their capacity to understand the subtle laws of nature grows, they will gradually be set free. As they learn the truth, the truth will automatically free them. When we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. We must learn to come under that divine government and accept the fact that nature's table is ever filled. Never was there a cosmic famine. The finite alone was, has wrought and suffered. The infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. God is always God. No matter what our emotional storm or what our objective situation may be, there is always a something hidden in the inner being that has never been violated. We may stumble, but always there is that eternal voice, forever whispering within our ear, that thing which causes the eternal quest, that thing which forever sings and sings. The next section is divine nature is in every person. This is the thing itself. Briefly, let us recapitulate. There is that within every individual which partakes of the nature of the universal wholeness and insofar as it operates, is God. That is the meaning of the word Emmanuel, the meaning of the word Christ. There is that within us, within us which partakes of the nature of the divine being, and since it partakes of the nature of the divine being, we are divine. It reacts to us according to our belief in it, and it is an immutable law, subject to the use of the least among us, no respecter of persons, it cannot be bound, our soul will never change or violate its own nature. All the denying of it will never make it change. All the affirming of it will never make it any more than it is. But since it is what it is, and works in the way that it works, it appears to each through their belief. It is done unto each one of us as we believe. We will say, then, that in spirit a person is one with God. But what of the great law of the universe? 
If we are really one with the whole, we must be one with the law of the whole as well as one with the spirit of the whole. If we try to find something difficult to grasp, then we, will sh we shall never grasp it because we shall always think of it as being incomprehensible. The mind which we discover within us is the mind that governs everything. This is the thing itself, and we should recognize its simplicity. Deep stuff. Long one. Have a great day.